Well, I, I will present you the work that I've done at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. And it's about um, polyadenylation, translation, microRNA stability, and cancer. I, uh, I've been studying uh, polyadenylation translation. And this is a general uh, mRNA with the cap open reading frame, splicing has already occurred, and there's a poly A tail at the very end, at the end of the three prime UTR, and the poly A site. This poly A tail is needed for uh, nuclear export from the cytoplasm, and it protects the mRNA from exonucleolytic degradation along its journey, and then it helps translation. Uh, some mRNAs, more or less 20% of the transcriptome, have an additional sequence very close to the poly A site that is called the cytoplasmic polyadenylation element. This is characterized by U's, uh, and at the very end of it, an A and another U. And this is bound by a protein, an RNA binding protein, called cytoplasmic uh, polyadenylation element binding protein, obviously. And this, in turn, recruits other factors. And one of them is GOLD2, or PAPD4, or TATACE2. This is for uh, germline deficient. It was discovered in, in worms. And this is a non-canonical poly A polymerase. So this basically elongates um, the polyadenosine tail at the end of three prime UTRs. And then there's another factor that gets recruited that it's called PARN, or poly A ribonuclease. And this is an enzyme that trims the tail and chops it to only a few nucleotides. The activity of these two proteins oppose one another, but the one of PARN prevails usually, so the poly A tail gets shortened. And uh, it can happen uh, upon some different types of uh, stimuli or cues, either extracellular or intracellular, that the signaling cascade gets activated and uh, uh, this converges in the phosphorylation of CPB1 and the expulsion of PARN from the complex, so the activity of GOL2 can prevail, poly A tail gets elongated, and this is needed for translation of these transcripts. Uh, the, this is uh, just a simplification of what happens. There are many more uh, factors that I will not go into uh, much detail here, but at the end, what uh, the end goal is to just recruit the 40S subunit of the ribosome to scan the 5' UTR of the mRNA to find the right uh, start codon and um, start translation. The CPB family of proteins is made by mainly four different um, homologs, uh, CPB1, 2, 3, and 4. CPB2, 3, 4 are more related to each other than they are to CPB1. And these four proteins have very similar structure. They have a, a C-terminal tail with two RNA recognition motifs <coughs> and zinc fingers at the very end, and they're all the same, one, two, three, four. And the part that is the most divergent is the N-terminus, and this, this is how we think they are regulated in different ways. So other RNA binding proteins or other effectors bind here and activate them in different ways. And they're not expressed at the same time in the cell or in the same types of cells, but they're expressed um, in, in different ways. And everything that I uh, said so far was discovered and characterized in Xenopus oocytes, so frog oocytes, and this is here what is called the maturation of frog oocytes that happens in the female frog gonads. And they go from stage one, that is a very small little ball that it's more or less one millimeter in diameter. And they grow uh, to stage six, they, there's a G2 arrest, then there is a further maturation step that is the uh, germinal vesicle breakdown in first meiosis. And then there's the mature oocyte that can be fertilized by a sperm cell. And then uh, this goes on with the development of the embryo. And what is remarkable about this system is that until there are 4,000 cells, there is basically no transcription. But proteins do increase and, uh, and, 
and decrease in the, in the cytoplasm of the oocyte. And this is mainly due to waves of polyadenylation, elongation, and shortening. And this, in turn, activate translation and therefore gene expression of these genes. Um, so are there other systems in which uh, polyadenylation-mediated translation is important? Yes, one is the brain. I don't know if you can see it here. This is a, a dendritic spine in a synapse. And upon stimulation, you can have uh, NMDA receptor gets activated and remodel the complex that I've been showing to you in the previous slides so that particular mRNAs get their poly-A tail elongated, activated, translated. And this, in, at the end, uh, modify the synapse so that um, the, the, the properties of the synapse are changed. And this is at the basis of, of memory and learning. And, and mice that lack uh, CPB indeed have uh, defects in memory and learning. But what I will be telling you about today is the role of CPB in uh, cellular senescence in human uh, foreskin fibroblast. And if this is the normal growth curve of fibroblast in the ones that we get in our cell bank, uh, you see that at some point, that is more or less 90 days, the cells stop to divide and enter uh, cellular senescence. And cellular senescence is, uh, limits the la um, replicative lifespan of a cell, and it's thought to be an anti-cancer mechanism. If we silence with a short hairpin CPB, you see that the cells continue to grow, therefore bypassing senescence. Whilst if you add back to the cells that have been silenced of CPB uh, as, uh, a short hairpin resistant CPB, you see that you uh, can restore senescence. And this is also exemplified by beta-gal staining at acidic pH, that it's a marker for senescence. And here you see that if you add back a resistant CPB to cells that have been silenced of CPB, you get senescence again, and this is uh, shown by this dark staining of cells. Whilst if you add a CPB that cannot bind RNA anymore, uh, you don't get staining uh, anymore. And this is just a control. And why does it happen? Because um, CPB regulates the P53 transcript and its translation. So here is a, just a, a scheme of P, the P53 transcript. This is the 3' UTR. Here you have the poly A site, the regular hex. And just a bunch of nucleotides upstream, there are the CP uh, elements. And these are bound by CPB and, uh, and promote translation. And in fact, if you silence uh, CPB with a short hairpin again, there's a, a decrease in P53 protein uh, expression. And uh, there is no change in the mRNA, meaning that the change is post-transcriptional. And in fact, we also demonstrated that CPB can bind um, the P53 3' prime UTR, but this RMPIP in which you overexpress uh, recombinant uh, or you overexpress CPB in the cells, you pull down and then you try to PCR the mRNA that uh, are attached. And P53 gets pulled down by CPB, but not the one that cannot bind RNA. And finally, just to demonstrate that this is due to an activation in polyadenylation and translation, what we usually do is the general um, paradigm experiment in frogs in which we inject in frogs the 3' UTR of uh, uh, P53 and then we monitor polyadenylation. So here you can see that um, uh, upon progesterone uh, um, addition that it's, it's a way to make them progress and to activate polyadenylation. So you see that Without progesterone, the poly-A tail of P53 is short, and upon progesterone treatment, the poly-A tail gets longer. But if, you, if we use a, a, a reporter that has the CPE elements uh, mutated, you get a much shorter tail, meaning that these elements are needed for polyadenylation. And uh, 
interestingly, uh, when uh, we do a two-step carcinogenesis assay in which we, we give two <coughs> nasty chemicals. We, we put nasty chemicals on the skin of mice, and these are uh, unpronounceable <coughs> chemicals. But you can see that if uh, the mice are knocked out of CPB, they get tumors uh, faster and more tumors. And so at this point, uh, one easy experiment that we wanted to do, since CPB and GOL2 act on the same uh, uh, pathway in the same mechanism, we wanted to silence GOL2, that is the polyapolymerase, and, and see if the effect that we see is the same as for CPB silencing. Uh, but uh, what we see is exactly the opposite. Here you see that uh, GOL2 has been silenced with a short hairpin, but we get an increase of P53. And also, we expected a reduction in uh, uh, P53 poly A tail, and instead we get an elongation. And also, the cells that have been depleted of GOL2, um, let's say, senesce faster or, or grow slower. And this is also exemplified by this beta gal staining. So upon short, uh, upon GOL2 knockdown, there is a uh, marked beta gal staining of the cells. So uh, this was very uh, mm, strange to us because we expected exactly the opposite, but the resolution of this seemingly um, uh, controversial result began with an uh, observation with this paper that was published in 2009 in which they saw that MIR 122 is uh, almost depleted in mice that lack GOL2, the poly A polymerase. But we know that the poly A polymerase uh, polyadenylates mRNAs, but here this paper speculates that it's also involved in monodenylation of microRNAs. And here you can see that the precursor levels of the microRNA stay the same, but the mature form is much uh, less, meaning that there is something happening post-transcriptionally. So um, the same happened in our cells. We wanted just to repeat the experiments done in this uh, paper here, and, to, and we could confirm the results. So short hairpin gold two cells have much less of MIR-122 compared to the wild type. And uh, the, the connecting point in the end was that CPB has two MIR-122 binding sites in its 3' UTR. And in order to study if these are functional, functional we designed uh, a construct that uh, had uh, luciferase, and appended with the CPB full 3' UTR, so comprehending both MIR-122 binding sites, and then we made deletions of one or the other or both. And here you can see that if one, uh, we set to one the expression of the full 3' UTR, uh, if we delete one of them or the other, we get a reduction in, uh, or, uh, in the repression, meaning it's expressed more. And if we delete both of them, the effect is at least uh, um, additive. And uh, the, so our theory was that a GOL2 monodenylates MIR-122, stabilizes it, and this has an effect on CPB that then has an effect on, on P53. But the reviewers asked us to demonstrate that, in fact, GOL2 uh, monodenylates microRNA, and we find the monodenylated microRNA in the cells, and this was the proof that we could sequence it out of the cells. So at this point, we wanted to go a little bit deeper in the characterization of the poly A polymerase and how it monodenylates microRNAs and what is the effect of monodenylation on the microRNA stability and on its function. And to do so, we, uh, or I did an experiment in which I uh, overexpressed uh, GOL2 and I immunoprecipitated it, either the wild type version or the one that is catalytically inactive. And then I tried to mix it with the microRNA and with um, alpha, uh, or sorry, gamma ATP. And here you can see that uh, 
Bo uh, MIR-122 and other micronase that at this point were selected at random uh, did get uh, monodenylated. Here you can see also the controls in which the uh, catalytically inactive version of GOL2 cannot uh, monodenylate micronase, and this is just a control. But since in this IP experiment we couldn't really rule out that the factor uh, pull down was only goal two, but it could come down also with other factors that could do the activity. I also um, overexpressed in bacteria goal two GST tag, and I repeated the same assay with pure goal two, meaning that goal two is able per se of monodenylating uh, microRNAs. And to further prove it, I also did a um, uh, micro, pre microRNA uh, maturation assay in which you incubate the pre microRNA with an extract and you monitor the, uh, the, the maturation of the microRNA with wild type um, cell extracts and cell extracts that have been depleted of GOL2. And here you can see that the wild type extract. Uh, uh, digest the pre microRNA to mainly two bands, one of 22 nucleotides and one of 23 nucleotides that correspond to MIR-122 and the adenylated version of MIR-122. Whilst if I uh, silence GOL2 and I use this extract to do the processing assay, you see that mainly one uh, band is formed here. And since this experiment couldn't really tell me if this additional band is due, is, is an A or any other nucleotide, I also performed a competition assay with GST, uh, GOL2, uh, microRNA, alpha-32 ATP, and then I competed with either cold ATP or, or cold UTP. And what you can see from the experiment is that cold ATP competes much better than cold UTP um, for, for the reaction, meaning that the preferred nucleotide is ATP. So in order to see whether um, this additional A makes the microRNA more stable, I did first a lot of northern blots, and these were very difficult because there is very little microRNA MIR-122 in, in the cells, and therefore I, I had to come up with a different uh, system. And this is the experiment that I did. I pre-annealed in vitro the microRNA, either without or with an additional A, and I labeled it radioactively, I transfected it into the cells, and then I monitored over time its stability. And this is the result. You see that the non-adenylated one de <coughs> decays fast in two days, whilst the adenylated one persists in cells. And this is a loading control, and this is just the graph, uh, the quantification of this and of multiple experiments. But this was very difficult to do. It, it took a long time, and then I also wanted to have a simpler system. So I, instead of transfecting the cells with these two species, I also did the experiment just by incubating these two RNA species into cell extracts. And here you can see that uh, I could replicate the same results also with an extract. So here you can see the MIR-122 with no A that decays with a certain rate. And MIR-122A keeps uh, being more stable. This is quantified here. And another uh, microRNA that was, again, selected at, at random, uh, uh, having an A or not having an A didn't make uh, a big difference. So the stability of the two is comparable. In order to see if the uh, increased stability is also uh, had a functional effect, I also uh, wanted to, uh, or I, I did another experiment in which I um, had the luciferase construct with the 3' UTR of CPB and the two MIR-122 binding sites. And then I had the MIR-122 and MIR-122 adenylated. And I transfected either this or this with the, this construct. And then I monitored over time the luciferase activity. And if uh, no, MIR-122 is transfected, uh, or this, I set this to, to 1, and with MIR-122 or MIR-122A, you see that I have a repression in luciferase activity, meaning that uh, the protein expression is reduced. 
and at 24 hours, I have a slight increase uh, of expression, meaning that the activity of the microRNA is reduced. And then at 48 hours, you see that the uh, microRNA that has the A appended is still more able to repress than the one that has no A. So uh, at this point, we wanted to know if this is an effect that, uh, uh, or something that happens only to MIR-122, or if uh, microRNA monodenylation is a more general thing. And to do so, we, want, we did um, uh, sequencing of um, um, microRNAs, or deep sequencing of microRNAs. And <coughs> what we found is uh, among all the microRNAs that we could sequence, more or less 9% had a single A, 5% had a single U appended, and 3.5% uh, had either one A or one U. And just to define what the single A or additional U means, it means that uh, these are non-templated non uh, uh, additions, so they um, do not occur in the genome. So it has to be something that happens after the microRNA has been chopped by Dicer. And um, in order to see if GOL2 has an effect on monodenylation, we silenced GOL2 and we sequenced the microRNAs and we wanted to know how many of them get uh, uh, less adenylation. And here every dot is a microRNA and this is the level of uh, monodenylation for each of them. So. In, in total, you have a two-fold reduction in monodenylated species upon GOL2 knockdown. And here you have either an increase or decrease in uridylation, meaning that GOL2 um, is more important for uh, adenylation than monouridylation. And here is just one example of uh, microRNAs. Uh, of one microRNA and the output that we get from the deep sequencing. So this is the sequence of the microRNA and uh, it is 22 nucleotides and all the other ones are non-templated additions. And here you can see that for this one in particular, you have more or less 10% of A additions and a little bit of, of U additions too. And uh, mm, other additions, uh, we, we could observe also some longer tails of multiple nucleotides or also even mutations in the middle, but most of these other events fell within the mutation rate of the sequencing reaction, so we didn't really consider them. And this really fits with what has been described in the literature so far, and more or less of all the microRNAs sequenced in many different cells, more or less 20% have an A addition, 20% a U addition, and then G and C occur much less uh, often. And uh, this data here also show that uh, A and G and U additions might be developmentally regulated or different tissues have different regulation of these additions. I wanted to know one of the main thing was what, is a monodenylation important for microRNA uh, stability and quantity in cells? So I compared the uh, amount of uh, microRNA that is on the y-axis and the adenylation, adenylated species on the x-axis. So basically here you see uh, in the top part all the microRNAs that increase upon GOL2 knockdown. Here are all the microRNAs that decrease upon GOL2 knockdown. And this right part are the ones who get more um, species adenylated, and here are the ones who get a decrease. But the relationship between the two was uh, non-existent. Uh, and I was a little bit worried that maybe um, my results were, were not that meaningful at this point. But this experiment in particular doesn't really take into account the other possible effects of GOL2 knockdown. It could regulate translation of many, many other proteins. And here I just show the uh, biogenesis of microRNAs. And you can imagine that GOL2 might regulate each uh, one of these steps that are here from uh, from the generation of the pry 
to the pre and then export uh, until the final dicing and loading into, into Argo. And also all of these proteins are also, um, uh, can be modified. So there are enzymes that modify the uh, precursor and the mature microRNA themselves, like ADAR can change some bases into the hairpins. Uh, Nerikim uh, described also uh, uh, oligouridylation of the precursor, and that has an effect too. So in order to dissect if the fact that I see is due to uh, difference in transcription or something that happens post-transcriptionally, I thought of measuring also the amount of the precursor. So here you see in gray the amount of the precursor, then you see the amount of monodenylated species upon gold to knockdown, and then in uh, light gray, the amount of the mature uh, microRNAs. And here is just a list of uh, randomly selected microRNAs. And I measure uh, these by qPCR and the monodenylation by deep sequencing. And what I could observe is that the microRNAs fell mostly in two categories. So the first one that I call non-monodenylation sensitive is in the gray box. And here, for example, if we take uh, LET7F, we put one as a reference for all the other three parameters. And you see that there's a decrease in the amount of the precursor, more or less there's half of it. There's a decrease in monodenylation, but the mature reflects the amount of the precursor, meaning that the monodenylation doesn't really have an effect. But for some other microRNAs, like these ones that I call monodenylation sensitive, you have that monodenylation does have an effect. And uh, for example, if you take MIR-145, uh, you start from one, you get an increase in the precursor, but a big decrease in monodenylation, and then the amount of the mature are much low. So, the amount of the mature doesn't reflect the amount of the precursor, meaning that there is something happening uh, at the post-transcriptional level. And in order to prove that what happens is um, due to post-transcriptional, uh, the post-transcriptional event of monodenylation and increased stability, I measured one, uh, the stability of one example from the non-monodenylation sensitive and two examples from the monodenylation sensitive. And here you can see that MIR-134A, that it's this one here, uh, basically doesn't really change too much uh, if uh, an A is appended to it. Uh, but for other ones, like MIR-145 that I've been describing before, you see that the normal one is unstable and gets stabilized by one uh, A addition. And the same happens for LET7D. It is unstable and gets stabilized by monodenylation. So at this point, I wanted to know what is the difference between the two? Is there anything in the sequence that can tell if one is sensible, sensitive and one is not? And I try to, to see if their nucleotide composition accounts for the differences. And I could find some differences, especially at the three prime end, but um, I couldn't really think of an experiment to follow up this, but one that was the, the analysis of one particular family of microRNAs, that is the LET7 family. And a family of microRNAs defined by microRNAs that have the same uh, seed sequence that is here shaded in gray, so they have exactly the same sequence here, but they have some mutations in regions outside of the seed. Here, for example, we have this G and G and G and C. And uh, from my previous experiment, I could see that there were two behaviors. One, monodenylation sensitive, and these were the uh, let 7 uh, D, I, and 98, or monodenylation uh, or non-monodenylation sensitive, let 7 A and F. And the difference between these two groups was in the last 10 uh, nucleotides. So you see that LET7A and LET7F are exactly the same, while the red ones are, do contain some mutations. So based on this rule that I completely made up in my, in my head, could I predict the effect on other microRNAs that were not represented in my deep sequencing study? And therefore, I analyzed LET7B and LET7E. And LET7B, 
uh, has two mutations. So my expectation was that this uh, um, was being regulated by monodenylation, while its evony was was not. And to prove this, I, I did exactly the same experiment. I transfected it into cells, and then I monitored the, the, the stability. And this is what you can see. Let's 7E is stable and remains stable upon an A, while let's 7B, this, this one with the two mutation, is unstable and gets stabilized. And these results are very uh, similar to um, something that has been described in the Bartel lab. Uh, and here, basically, they took one micron A and they made point mutations in every position from 1 to 22. And if this is uh, the expression of the wild type uh, <coughs> micron A, you see that uh, if you have mutations at the very end of the micron A that are M01, 02, 03, you get a uh, uh, a change in stability, meaning that nucleotides at the very end are really important for the stability of the micronase, but not the ones that are in the center. And obviously the ones that are in the seed are also very important for stability. But uh, just to uh, uh, bring everything uh, together, um, I also wanted to know if this had any uh, both the CPB proteins, since they are involved in P53 regulation and in uh, senescence, and also the gold tools that regulate microRNAs, and microRNAs are misregulated in a lot of, lot of type of cancers. I did this meta-analysis of this family of proteins in more than 100 types of cancers. And here you see, obviously, blue is the, this particular mRNA is downregulated in this particular type of cancer whilst the uh, red means that it's upregulated. And I have to say that this is at the level of mRNAs and doesn't account everything that happens afterwards. So the, what would be really important is to have the protein levels, but that is not available yet. But you can see some extraordinary um, correlations between, uh, for example, uh, tumors in the reproductive tissues more uh, they mostly have CPB1 reduced, and we know that CPB1 is uh, uh, very um, highly expressed in reproductive tissues. And uh, for example, CPB3 uh, here is downregulated in most of the tumors of the digestive tract. And um, I have to point out that most of these relationships are unexplored, apart from CPB1 and something about CPB4 that was recently shown to be involved in uh, pancreatic cancer progression. And regarding GOAL2, the protein that monodenylates microRNA, the relationship are a little bit weaker, but we know that uh, microRNA act like um, rheostats in regulate more than switches in regulating the, three, the expression of particular mRNAs. And therefore, even small changes might result in the end in, in, in drastic effects on cellular behavior. And in fact, I also uh, tried to do another type of analysis in, uh, in a very, very big uh, data set from the Tuchel lab in which they uh, sequenced the microRNAs from normal breast tissue ductal carcinoma in situ and invasive ductal carcinoma. So this is the first step of um, mammary um, carcinogenesis, and this is the invasive step. And uh, here, every point is a microRNA, or not the microRNA, but it's monodenylation state. And here you can see that in the first step of carcinogenesis, so the ductal carcinoma in situ, you have a marked reduction in monodenylated species. And then this happens also in invasive ductal carcinoma. Here, the data are a little bit more all over the place, but because I think that then at that point, the cells really uh, go a little bit crazy at that point. And I, I think I will 
conclude because maybe everyone is hungry. <laughs> and uh, with the conclusion, so goal two, monodenylase specific microRNAs. We don't know really how the specificity is achieved and why only one A is added. Goal two is known to add multiple adenylate residues on mRNAs, but why only one A on microRNAs? There might be another protein that blocks this or uh, something that we don't know yet. And why monodenylation stabilizes some microRNAs? And why only one, one A makes a microRNA more stable? Is the ternary complex uh, more stable? The, Ago2 risk microRNA and mRNA complex more stable, or are monodenylated microRNA safe for later? So they are not used. There, there have been some data showing that longer microRNAs are less loaded into risk. So meaning that maybe the cell has a way to uh, keep stored, like a little bit like the mRNAs with the polyadenylation thing, stored in the cytoplasm and safe for later. Nucleotides in the three prime end make the microRNA monodenylation sensitive. Obviously, microRNA stability is combinatorial. Are there other determinants? And then both GOAL2 and CPBs are misregulated in several cancers. CPB controls translation of many protein important in cancer. I haven't talked about it, but for example, the um, TPA, um, tissue plasminogen activator is misregulated in cancer, and it is regulated by CPB4. But are there other mRNAs that are regulated by the CPBs? And here the, 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 the best experiment would be to uh, IP, cross-link and IP and find the targets of CPBs. And then this piece of unpublished data, but I think I, I cannot, uh, I will never be able to pu publish this because I cannot uh, take those samples from the the mm, Tuchel da database and measure the um, pre microRNAs of all those microRNAs that have been studied. So, mm, does this lead to less repressive potential and uncontrolled proliferation? The, the, there are data that show that shorter um, 3 prime UTRs uh, are related to cancer. So basically having less stable microRNAs would mean, uh, w w would end up in the same effect more or less. And I think I will stop it here. And I would like to thank these people that really helped along the way. And especially Joel Richter who has been a great mentor. And that's it. <laughs>